Our gospel reading this morning is from the second book of Luke, verses 1 through 7. It's in your New Testament Pew Bible on page 58. In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to the city of David called Bethlehem because he was descended from the house and family of David. He, was, he went to be registered with Mary to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in bands of cloth, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. The word of the Lord. Do you remember a time ever in your life, young or old, any time in your life, when you were made to feel unwelcome, when you felt unwelcome, no matter the circumstances, no matter the reason, do you ever remember that time? And do you remember what it felt like? Do you remember what it felt like? I always, this time of year, remember a time in my life. My dad is now 90 years old, but a long time ago, when I was 11 years old, my dad and I engaged on a journey to go see the Atlanta Falcons in, in Atlanta. Well, that's where they would be, right in Atlanta. And it was the first time I'd ever gone to a professional football game. In fact, professional football was kind of, I'm, I'm dating myself, but it was kind of new in Atlanta, and certainly new in the Southeast. There just weren't that many teams in the Southeast. So I was very excited about traveling with my dad to Atlanta, which was about a five, at that time, four or five hour drive, maybe five, six hour drive away. And so we began our journey late on a Saturday afternoon. We didn't get off till later out of Charlotte. And we headed down Interstate 85. Now, Dad had not made any plans except getting the tickets. So we headed down that way, just expecting that once we got to as big a city of Atlanta, we would find a place to stay. But at that time, Atlanta, even as large as it already was, had not yet built up in regards to uh, the number of hotel rooms. And it turned out that that weekend, there was all kinds of stuff going on. There was a convention, I think it was a major football game, college football game. There was all kinds of things happening. So when we finally got into Atlanta, it was probably about 9, 9.30, we started going from place to place to place to find a place to stay. And everywhere we went, the rooms were full. And we kept doing this for about an hour. And it was getting late. And I was getting anxious, to say the least. I was anxious as a 11-year-old anyway. Now I was getting really, really anxious. My dad, very cool guy, he's always been cool, just said, don't worry, we'll find something. But it kept getting later and later. And I began to think, I began to even, you know, whine, which I'm very good at. I began to whine that, well, maybe we just thought I'd go home. Oh, let's turn around, let's go back. You know, I'm real good at that. And dad said, no, we'll keep looking. Finally, we got to a Ramada Inn. And I guess the manager took pity on us, because it was really getting late. He took pity on us. And he said, I've got one room that we are not uh, letting anyone stay in right now, because it needs some repair, but, but I will let you all stay in it. So he let us stay in that one room. And I never forget two feelings. First of all, the feeling of being unwelcome. Being rejected. It's horrible to feel rejected time after time after time. And of course, this was just, we were, we were still nearby. We could turn around and go back. And then that feeling of absolute relief 
when that one person took pity on us and said, yes, you are welcome. I have a place for you today to stay. I'll never forget that. I'll never forget uh, the kindness of that manager so that our, my father and I did not have to turn back and make that long drive back. Now, of course, Jerry, Je, Je, of course, Joseph and Mary had no such opportunity as we just heard in that story from Christ's birth. Joseph went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to the city of David because he was descended from the house and family of David. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child. It's a very subtle account in the Gospel of Luke. And I've always felt that that subtlety masked the emotions that Joseph and Mary must have felt as they made that journey and entered into a time when it was easy for them to not be welcome. Because the baby was coming, and as any obstetrician or law enforcement officer, officer or taxi driver or anyone will testify when a baby decides to enter the world, they're coming. Doesn't matter the hour, doesn't matter the setting, does not matter the circumstances. Babies get born all the time. And this baby, this promise, is going to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the end. Now, I don't want to destroy your image of the creche, the creches that you have. We have a creche as well. But there may be more to this story than we realize if we correctly translate the language. I once heard Presbyterian scholar and historian Dr. Kenneth Bailey, one of my favorite people, explain the more likely circumstances of Christ's birth. Dr. Bailey spent 40 years living and teaching in seminaries and institutes in Egypt, Lebanon, Jerusalem, and Cyprus. He is a Palestinian Christian. For 20 of those years, Dr. Bailey was professor of New Testament and head of the biblical department of the Near East School of Theology in Beirut, where he also founded and directed the Institute of Middle Eastern New Testament Studies. So this is a man who knows Arabic, who speaks the language of Jesus and the language of the common people, and of course knows his Greek as well. Plus, more than that, Dr. Bailey understands the culture, the Palestinian culture of the first century and what life was like. And he came to our church, one of the churches I was a minister, and he shared with us, and you can even find this online, what he feels what actually happened when Christ was born. According to Dr. Bailey, the word translated as in, I-N-N, -N, in our Greek New Testament, is more accurately translated as guest room. Guest room in the original Aramaic of first century Palestine. In Greek, it can mean both, but in Aramaic, which is the language of Jesus, the word means guest room. A typical Palestinian house of that day consisted of an area near the door, often with a dirt floor, where the family's animals were kept at night. Now you may ask yourself, good grief, why? But they had kept the animals in the house, in their household. Well, there was two very good reasons for it. First, so they wouldn't be stolen. And that's how the family lived. You had your animals. You had your source, your animals. You had to have them. So that they would not be stolen. And second, because on the cooler nights, the animals were a source for heat, which we could use right now in the sanctuary. So if you had a cow, or a donkey, you'd like to bring it in, help yourself. Because our heat is out. It'll be back on Tuesday. But the heat of the animals would keep the whole household warm. The family lived and slept in a raised part of the same room set back from the door. There was also almost always a guest room, either upstairs or on the roof or on a second floor, 
Adjoining the family common room also may be on the lower floor. Typically, the lower area near the door had a manger. Manger for feeding the animals and, and a trough for watering the animals. And that's the way most of the homes were. And that's the way many of the homes were in Bethlehem at that time. Dr. Bailey asserts, based on his knowledge of Palestinian culture in the first century, that Joseph and Mary were in a house in Bethlehem as she went through labor. Either the house of a compass compassionate stranger who had opened their doors to this couple and this in a dire situation, or more likely, he said, a distant relative. Someone they knew or related to. But because so many other relatives had come to Bethlehem for the census, the upstairs guest room, which normally they would have used, was not available. And that forced Mary to give birth in the lower area of the house, in the only place that was available, where the animals were stabled and fed, the manger. Now, it might be hard for us today to understand why no one was willing to offer Mary the more comfortable room. But, you know, come to think of it, when you consider what's going on in our culture, maybe it isn't so hard to understand. Certainly, we've closed our doors lately to many, many people journeying long journeys in desperation to find safety, to find a place to live. We have done that over and over again even to the point of some people dying. And we think about that. That's what this story is about. Hospitality. Opening one's heart to people in needs. Opening one's resources, their home, people who are in need. Isn't it always true that humanity has always struggled to find room, to make room for kindness and love and compassion. We talk a good game. But when it comes down to it, it's a lot easier for us to close the door and lock it than to open it and say, welcome. The human heart has always been filled with superstition and fear, cruelty, conquest, cynicism, and self-interest. And if, in this story, these out-of-town relatives found themselves in a somewhat desperate situation, well, we'll accommodate them, but it's really their problem. It's their problem, not ours. We hear that same thought expressed toward the poor and the unfortunate today. They created their own problems. They have to just suffer for it. That's their problem. But that's not the way God feels. And we know that. Because we see it in the story. We see where God has something else in mind. Not just for Mary and Joseph and their child. But for all the Marys and Josephs and children of this world. When God created a place for the birth of Christ in a manger. God was creating a place for us in God's eternal kingdom. That night, in the most humble corner of a house, in one of the most humble corners of the world, God staked out a corner of our hearts that would eventually grow to encompass the lives of countless other people. Where the world could find no place for God, God found a place for us through His love. A place which God's Son, the Messiah Christ, would affirm just before He went to the cross for our sins. In my Father's house there are many rooms. If it were not so, would I tell you that I have gone to prepare a place for you? And if I have gone to prepare a place for you, that language to prepare a place I will come again and I will take you to myself so that where I am there you may be also and you know the way to the place
place where I'm going, for I am the way and the truth and the life. We sometimes don't connect his words to his disciples just before he went to the cross with what happened to him as an infant at his birth. But there is a connection, isn't there? I go to prepare for you the place that God prepared for me when I was born. And that is what celebrating the birth of Jesus, the birth of God incarnate is all about. Filling rooms, filling vacancies in our hearts and minds, and filling spaces in the way that we treat each other. God saw the emptiness, the loneliness, the desolation that sin inflicts upon God's beloved creation. And God filled it with the love of a newborn infant, an infant born for us. But if this is true, as we affirm, as we believe, it seems that the world still has a difficult time accepting this gift, accepting the hospitality of God's child, accepting a place in God's kingdom. Even we who believe find ourselves at times, don't we, still turning on the no vacancy sign to those around us? Of course we do. When we refuse to give, when we refuse to forgive, when we drown in our cynicism and doubt because we believe we are so smart or so right, when we build our little fortresses of judgment, and in building them we exclude everyone who does not meet our expectations or meet our satisfaction, then we shut the door on the one who begs us to open our hearts to him. You know, there's an old illustration that's I've used in the pulpit before for many years and that's been used many times. You probably know of it about the, the famous painting of Jesus knocking on the door and the first thing, if you look hard at you notice is there is no handle on the door that Jesus is knocking on. They did not build outside handles on those doors in the time. You had to open it from inside. You had to open and let the person in who was knocking. Same thing today. Christian writer Rick May describes how God confronts our vacant souls in his book titled An Emerging Spirituality. And this is what he writes. We read about the name Jesus was given at his birth, Emmanuel, meaning God with us. This God wasn't content with dwelling in fiction. This God wasn't content living with the seraphim, and this God wasn't content with bulls and goats anymore. This God wanted to dwell with you, with all of your mess, with all of your failures, with all the dirtiness that is you. This God wanted to sit with you. Here's the amazing thing. God doesn't care if you're a Catholic, a Lutheran, postmodern, or however you describe yourself, God still wants to sit with you. It's an amazing thing to think about, isn't it? God wants to dwell with us, not just dwell with us. God wants to be beside us, with us. And are we willing to let God do that? Are we willing to make room at our tables in our living rooms, around our trees, or whatever we have in our lives, in our work, in our school, in our friendships, in our communities, are we willing to make room to have vacancy for God so that God can be with us? To say that Christmas is a busy or full time is an understatement, isn't it? Over the next few days, 
our hours will be filled with all kinds of stuff going on, busyness and noise and travel and food and celebration, and of course the inner busyness of emotions and remembrances in the midst of a very sentimental season. But that's all just vacant time, meaningless time, if we do not make room in our own hearts, if we do not turn the vacancy sign on for the Son of God. Are we going to allow the flotsam and jetsam of a holiday season to drown out the sound of an engine crying in the night, looking for a place to stay, looking for the kind of love that will take that engine in? Is there any empty place in our lives this morning that need filling? Someone is knocking on our doors. Maybe in our families. Maybe in our friendships. Maybe just knocking on the doors in this world needing a place to be. To be loved. To be cared for. To be forgiven. To be helped. With no conditions. With no questions asked. And that is God's child doing that. Where is the no vacancy sign in our lives this morning? And how can we turn on the no? And open our hearts to Christmas. Because that's what Christmas is for. It's not for seeing beautiful lights. It's for opening our hearts and living as the Son of God calls us to live. No vacancy. All oh, those signs will be up, but may they never be up in our lives for those who are in need. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us now stand and sing our hymn number 92.